Good evening, everyone. And uh, Riggs Eckleberry here. Join, with joining me is Tom Marchesello, our Chief Operating Officer, for a very exciting, uh, because he was on TV. So we're going to see. Seconds of fame. <laughs> yeah, that is seconds of fame for sure. So let me just do the honors while people are joining us, as always. This is What is a New Gold? And it is a new asset class that we believe is recession proof. It is April the 8th, briefing number 105. And we have a usual safe harbor statement, which says we do our very best. And that's about all you can say. So now I'm going to switch to a video share mode because, Tom, you were, as you said, you know, you had your seconds of fame. So. Let's see. Let's see what happened. Almost famous now. Many of you have questions. A water treatment expert joining us now with some answers about the site failure and concerns for water con contamination there. Tom Marchesello, Chief Operating Officer of Origin Clear and Clearwater, joining us now. Thanks for coming on tonight, Tom. Thank you very much. So yeah, some new developments uh, tonight. The Department of Environmental Protection saying just a few hours ago that they found what they thought was a second breach, but it is in fact not the case anymore. The EPA and DEP both coordinating on site there. What are your thoughts on these latest developments that continue to change uh, almost hour by hour these days? Well, it's a very dynamic situation. Thank God there's not a second breach if that's true. You know, we've seen today a lot of people from the governor and, you know, Vern Buchanan, our congressman, talking about the situation this afternoon. And I think they've, they've done the right thing. You've got the Army Corps coming in. You've got... You know, the different guys from the EPA coming in as well, and they're making good recommendations. You know, and obviously safety is the biggest concern. But everybody's le left with this question of what the heck is going on? Why did this happen in the first place, right? And that's got a lot of people very concerned. Exactly. What are your thoughts on what happened in the first place with all of this? Well, from our research and understanding of the industry, you know, this was kind of a disaster in the making for like over a decade plus. This unfortunate site was you know, part of a bankruptcy of a company who didn't deal with the problem on site and then just kind of left the bag hanging on the public and nobody really stepped in to actually ever fix the issue. And you just kind of waited for it to decay and turn into a problem. And that's so really terrible. You mentioned, you know, we've now got Army Corps of Engineers coming in. We've got uh, DEP, the governor, but this all started what was a week ago. Should they have been coming in sooner? Well, you know, there's a ton of information about the site where they were here sooner. There's reports from 2013 and on where they've been looking at situations like this. This particular site should have been cleaned up many years back. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is they've been discharging now water to try to reduce the load on the gypsum stack to prevent the walls from breaking and having a catastrophic failure and flood. But that's different than actually treating the water. When you have these ponds full of toxic water, they're very intense. They are basically at a load level where the nutrients and the phosphates and the heavy metals that are in this water are so many magnitudes greater than the normal amount of wastewater people are used to dealing with. You know, people get very upset when they see sewage leaking into the bay, but then they think, oh, gypsum stack water, and they don't really think about it. But it's like 20 to 50 times more toxic. That's a very interesting point you bring up. You know, we keep asking what is in this water? What about that actual water contamination? Every time we hear about it, they just they, they kind of pass it, pass it off and don't really give us exactly an answer. So what we're being told is not direct about what is in this water. Can you clear that up for us? Well, they'll tell you it's salt, mm -hmm. which is really kind of humorous, actually. It's a type of salt that's accurate, but it's sulfuric acid. It is also things like possibly mercury and you know, there's cadmium in this stuff and radium and uranium. So these are actually metals that are part of, you know, what happens when you dig up phosphate rock and then you put it through the fertilizer process where they add sulfuric acid to it. And they basically make this wonderful chemical compound of goop that is not healthy for humans and or sea life. And unfortunately, then the, the way they dispose of it is by putting it into these gypsum stacks and they allow time and some other processes to try to reduce the load over time, but it never really goes away. And that's a real mistake. Okay, so a lot of big chemicals, a lot of big words with all of this, you know, we know that it could potentially kill animals, fish kills, red tide, something to be concerned about. Correct. What could it do to humans? Well, that's a tougher question. The okay. Army Corps said it's not dangerous for humans, you know, when dealt with properly. But what we do know is, you know, Tampa Bay's had a long history of red tide. So on the easy way, on an environmental level, this could be very disastrous. 
you know, there's always discharges into the bay and the Gulf, but it's done, you know, over time and stretched out over the course of a year. This thing, if it actually burst, would basically drop a load in the bay, the equivalent in one day would pollute the equivalent of one year's worth of pollution into the bay. And there's no way the bay can absorb that much nutrient and not cause algae blooms and fish kills. Wow. Okay. So what does this really look like? You know, we're hoping for the best, that there isn't an imminent massive collapse. There's not some sort of what could potentially be a 20 foot wall of flooded water. If it were to flood into the streets, into the bay, what would that look like for us in the future? Like moving forward days after that happening? Well, you'd have a contamination zone that the EPA would cordon off and they'd have to actually let it settle and wash it out. It would take some time to clean the ground, the ground water systems, the actual bay area. I, I don't think anybody really knows because this would be kind of a really one of a kind event, which everybody's watching. It's really that big a disaster if it really blew up like that. Wow. OK, so. We know that here in Florida, there's, I think, 27 of these types of gypsum stack facilities here in Florida. Possibly, I think there was a recent acquisition of more of them. I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't quote me on that. But, uh, you know, what can Florida do to fix this problem? Clearly, this is a detrimental problem to the Sunshine State. Uh, what do we do from here? Yeah, the industry, you know, needs to modernize and step up a bit. You know, there's a combination of regulation that needs to happen at the state level because the state regulates this and they have to make what's called on-site water treatment more mandatory. You at the point of mining, they can do on-site water treatment and at the point of the fertilizer plants, they can do additional treatment. So the things like, you know, MBRs, which are membrane bioreactors, they basically can, can side stream this water that's sitting in a pool push it through a machine that does like reverse osmosis processes and remove some of these, you know, contaminants from the water and then separate the water from the contaminants and then sequester those materials and push them to other sites. You know, it's basically waste management. Okay. Lastly, before we go, if you don't mind, can you give us a snapshot of what this would look like short term and what it would look like long term for both the Sarasota and Manatee counties uh, surrounding areas if Piney Point were to collapse? Well, obviously, the, the closer you are to the site is the higher problem you're going to have. So Mandy's obviously going to possibly be impacted as well as the bay. So, you know, look, we're a tourist attraction. We have all these beautiful beaches that people come to. I live here in Sarasota, and I take my daughter to the beach all the time. I don't want to be worried about is the water bad, is there going to be algae, you know, red tide problems where I can't breathe. And those are things that people worry about, obviously, in our communities. It hurts our tourism in industry, it hurts the real estate business, and it basically makes people uncomfortable. But in the end of the day, this is a problem that's been building for years, and I think you got to address this. I think the people really should get focused on making sure that this doesn't happen again. All right, Tom, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that is quite an interview. I did good, right? That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, first of all, I was impressed with the uh, interviewer. She seemed to have her act together, and then you were yeah. responsive, which was great. Uh, so thank you for that. Well, our and, team is really prepared. They gave some talking points to the uh, media person as well as we were prepared because you and I had actually been talking about this uh, last summer, remember? You know, we were covering this in the, one of these very same briefings, I agree. I'm going to preview um, the press release we're putting out overnight and um, what the next steps we're taking. So we want to come in and let 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 us give free advice, obviously, it's a major, major project, so we can't you know, give it all away, but we want to help. If we go all the way down here, we've got Dan really commenting on how much of a mess this is. It's amazing. The numbers are shocking when you do the mathematics. We, the whole engineering team on Tuesday actually took a look at this and we calculated, you know, what are you really dealing with here in the water and how much load is this really? It's millions of pounds of toxins. Crazy. Yes, and Piney Point alone is four years with a cost of $50 million, and we don't know who's going to be selected for the job, but nonetheless, we want to be in there uh, giving any advice that we can possibly give, and of course, at no charge since we live here. So that's excellent. So that's what's going on in the morning. I thought we did a pretty good quarter in Q1. How did it go? We were, it was we were really close to our normal quarterly number. Uh, we were running a little bit behind in January or February, 
Uh, it just seemed like there was a bit of a, a hangover lag coming out last year, but then all of a sudden March came roaring in. It was like overwhelming, like, you know, Mark and Mike and the guys really closed the quarter out really strong. Uh, but it was, it was a little bit, you know, on the tail. Well, they did pull it through. And, um, you know, do you think this is a, I got some commentary that maybe buyers are trying to get ahead of the commodity prices rising. Is that maybe? Yeah, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen people concerned about commodity price inflation, things like steel, uh, supply chain impacts. You know, COVID has been with us for all too long now. And there's been some realignments of getting supplies, you know, in the supply chain. So it's starting to filter its way through. And then there's just, you know, a lot of this inflationary concerns where people are a little uncertain. But it, a lot of businesses weren't quite sure what to do. They were holding off, trying to see if it got clear. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we better do something. And you see a big rush right now. Good. Well, and that's um, actually bullish for us and bullish for the rest of the year. Um, I know that we're getting ready to file our annual report uh, for last year. And, and as I, the only brag I allowed myself was that we, ne- we did not qualify for the PPP second round. <laughs> Okay. which means that we were not down quarter to quarter for any of the quarters last year. Okay. And uh, you know what? Hold my head up high that we did not take the government's money this time around. I think the guys worked really hard and, you know, everybody stayed pretty safe too, you know, considering last year was a wild year for sure. And I, I think the team really rose to the occasion, did a good job. Well, that's excellent. So Tom, thank you for that. I'm going to run uh, the presentation that Ken Berenger and I have been working on. And um, feel free to stick around, Tom, but I'm going to have Ken come in on audio and comment as he, as he wishes. This is a new uh, PowerPoint that talks about a planet-threatening crisis and how Urgent Clear can help. And of course, we know, despite what people think, that the tri- this trillion-dollar industry really only treats one-fifth of the world's sewage. And can we get an even higher? And of course, a lot of people don't think so. Well, let's take a look at the trends. Big problem, of course, is that the uh, federal government contributes only a fraction of what it once contributed to water costs, despite all the talk of infrastructure. It seems that Washington, Republican or Democrat, talks a lot of talk about infrastructure, but just doesn't get around to it. So it's a sad but true fact. And cities are charging more, which also means, I mean, it's good for us, I guess, but it also means that businesses now can spend money on their own treatment. And you know this, Tom, from uh, looking at Dan Early's growing backlog that he's got a lot of private parties in there who need help, like breweries and stuff. So here we have, uh, in fact, here's where we've gone ahead and estimated it, uh, estimated two thirds of our bidding backlog consists of such private customers. And the the Dan Early product line really is the one that that meets the needs of water system in a box and so forth. I'll never forget, Tom, when... uh, the chief engineer for that water chain, uh, the hotel chain came and came to you and he said, I, I want that thing. <laughs> it was definitely a thing that they wanted. Uh, we, we had communicated that it was modular and businesses want modular. Anyway, two thirds of them would adopt our products, which means that a generously eight figure pipeline, half of it would close if we went to water as a service. Now, water as a service has already happened. Aquaventures invented the term and got sold to Culligan for a billion dollars cash, not too shabby. And recently Autodesk acquired an AI for water software company for a billion dollars. And of course, Dan Early has some great software too. So next generation is us. We wanna uh, move into the next generation of water as a service. It's called water on demand. So high speed deals, high margins. Uh, Dan Early estimates that what we charge now, let's say it's $500,000. Well, over the life of a service contract, it would turn into a million dollars. But the client's happy because they only pay for the water they use. Now, here's what's great. Water on demand is a money for money play. In other words, if for some reason we don't have the capacity to do the work ourselves, we farm it out to another, another water company. We do like the modular designs, more, more income streams. I mean, this is a beautiful thing because people just subscribe to water treatment. Of course, we've got our um, 20 plus year manufacturing company, our patent protected um, modular systems, the capability of running it as a network. And of course, we're bringing in capital through our partnerships, especially in real estate. 
So it really enables doing to water what Cell did to telecom, what Netflix did to entertainment. And sure enough, you have ridiculous sums of money having been made in cell phone networks, on Netflix, of course. Um, what did it take? Well, in cell phones, it took 10 years. And then to get to the, that monthly cell plan, well, that now has begun to happen in the water industry. Netflix, remember DVDs? Huh. So we have an, we have an offering that enables us to fund this rollout. And uh, I'm not going to get too deeply into it, but you know, you get paid to wait. It um, converts to stock, and then, of course, you can then take uh, ride the stock on up from there after you've been repaid or cash out. And then, what's great is you got triple warrant coverage: three warrants that stack on top of each other. If you wonder what a warrant is, it's very simply a right to buy stock at a predetermined low price. You must be accredited or offshore, and it is a $100,000 unit, which we do reduce as needed. There's an excellent spreadsheet that uh, Ken will show you that I won't get into today. I might, I might in another, a future date. It's very um, self-explanatory. But basically, the way this is important is the water industry sees this as a, the first real global water treatment market. They will not have to be salesmen as much as white knights reduce the one year or more cycle to down to weeks and potentially huge margins over the full life cycle up to 50 years of the product. Very simple, sign a water purchase agreement, mon uh, remote monitoring, simple subscription model, focus on service, not selling. Now, capability initially delivered through a partner network. You will be hearing about that next week. One of my big concerns when I started getting into water and demand is how the heck do we make sure we deliver to contract? It's something called a service level agreement, SLA. Well, how, I was in high tech. I knew that how that worked. Well, how do we make that happen? And in fact, we have a partner who is very much up to speed on that. And I'll be covering that next week. Subscription water really means that people, you know, are willing to pay more just to make sure that you take care of the problem. And that's really what people in business feel about water. So double digit yield, uh, the 10% dividends. And then when you convert, you get these four di uh, distinct, what we call liquidity events, um, convert to common stock, warrant A, warrant B, warrant C, to build the internet of water. And we've now um, done the, the analysis that shows that a $10 million investment in water subscription systems can generate 110 million plus over 25 years, and we'll show you that if you're interested. And here's what's important. All this equipment will not be sold. It'll be put out to work, stand under our name, which helps create assets for us in our ultimate plan to NASDAQ uplist. So it is uh, what Ken likes to call a global micro utility network because these are in a way micro utilities, uh, these water companies. And we're also plan to acquire companies to scale up ourselves. And we will be one of those cool, sustainable and ESG players, which of course is a real thing. America needs us. There's the, um, the violations of the Clean Water Act um, all over the country. So the uh, regulation that we're offering this under is Regulation D, just so you know. And there is the disclaimer. So Ken, this is a pretty decent um, PowerPoint I just went through here. Yeah, thank you. I, I... This came as a result of what lots of late night you and I talking about, you know, how we how we position and also how we try to explain it in a way where people don't go, excuse me. You know, I, 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 I had a very interesting conversation today with Brendan Fitzgerald, a longtime uh, investor. His brother had come on, who I don't think I've ever spoken with. Very savvy business guy. And uh, I was kind of laying out our, our our plan. I don't think he ever spoke to me before. It was basically because, you know, dad had passed and we were kind of getting things squared away. And Sean had some very, he was, he was finishing my sentences for me um, on, on the subscription model. He basically said, so, so you're basically removing all the CapEx, turning it into OpEx. I said, oh God, I wish, I wish we had Riggs was on the phone. He also said, so you're telling me that your TAM, you know, total accessible market, is five, and he used the term TAM repeatedly. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a second of, to remember what it was, but he said it a couple of times. He goes, so your TAM's $5 trillion. I said, yeah. Four, four, really. I mean, yeah, if you, if you deduct what, what's being done already. 
Right. But the total accessible market yes. is five trillion, right? 100%. So the remaining TAM is four trillion. And I said, yes. I said, did we get there? No. I said, but my goodness, if we can access half that market. Oh, um, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, and, and again, he finished one of my sentences, which was odd because the man had never spoken to me before. So when people who have never even thought about this before, if you're explaining it in simple enough terms where they're able to kind of calculate where you're going with it, I, I think I think we, we, we finally kind of harmonized on how we describe this to the world. We know what we're talking about. And our investors know what we're talking about. The rest of the world needs to know what you're talking about. You, you mentioned earlier doing what cell phones did to telecom, what Netflix did to entertainment. Now, hindsight being 2020, what do both of these models have in common? Very modest monthly subscriptions, which, made, which triggered a worldwide adoption, right? So that, so that very, very modest, whether it's $14.95 for Netflix or you know, $179 for your cell phone, those very modest accessible fees for anybody in the world triggered a, a, a worldwide complete transformation of two underlying legacy industries, okay? We now have a third legacy industry that can be transformed in the identical fashion. And the fact that these trillion dollar giants have already paved the path for us leaves the guesswork out of it. it it's, such a, it's such a gift having these guys go in the mine ahead of us. You do not want to be, you know, the, the pioneer with the arrow on his back. And that's, it's a wonderful thing that Aqua Ventures did that, um, yeah. that Autodesk and so forth. So, right. you know, in fact, really it was um, the story of, of what we've done the last three years has really been to find the, the lowest common denominator business model and adopt that, right. which makes it the most universal, right? Right. What, what I often describe Aqua Ventures kind of first foray into this, what, what the, the real gift here was, what they did in a, I think Aqua Ventures did a couple of, a year or so ago, it, what, they, what they did was, um, it was Netflix 10 years ago. The idea was phenomenal, but before they had the delivery, in other words, we couldn't really stream movies on Netflix on our laptops 10 years ago because the bandwidth wasn't there and the, the computer, computing speed wasn't there. But the idea, if it could survive the technological advancements you know, in delivery, was going to be phenomenal, right? Uh, it op- so what they did was they opened the door in a limited way to changing what was wrong with water, taking it from this, you know, hundred year old kind of infrastructure utility model into something a little bit more nimble. You know what I mean? It had more of a privatized utility model. Now we, we just kind of picked up from there. And well, I'll- because it's very important to know that Aqua Ventures, even though they were doing water as a service, they were massive desal plants for islands. Right. Right. This is not all the way down to the decentralized business as we are doing. This is, the, I think, the, the significant next generation empowered by these modular systems we have. Right, exactly. So, in other words, they were what you'd call private utilities, right? Yes. They were semi-permanent systems that had to be very, very credit-worthy partners because if these guys didn't pay, they had a huge problem. Mm-hmm. They weren't going to be able to show up with a truck and, and just scale it away. So what we've added is that, uns- that unlimited scalability uh, f- factor, which, you know, we'll, we'll bring it there. They don't pay, we take it away. We don't think that's going to be a problem, but having, having a plan B, having the ability to take it away is huge. And, and, and I, what I got was a really positive comment today from, I, I spoke to about, as you know, <laughs> about 13 or 14 investors in a row, 45 minute intervals back to back from like eight in the morning to like six at night. So I got a lot of really, really good feedback. And what really resonated with a lot of folks is I said, we, we, we finally cracked the code on a way to simply put, not speaking water speak, we found a way to the ability to fully annuitize every piece of water treatment equipment we make for the next five decades. And that resonates, the ability to annuitize this stuff. Another comparison I made was you can't sell a 16-year-old girl in a third world country a $1,500 phone. You can't do it. What you can do is here, take this plan. And the phone's free. Of course it's not. But here you are with a $1,500 phone in your hand that you purchased from the manufacturer and you're selling the service, not the machine, right? Which we're doing on a much larger scale. And and I think those two ways of describing it has helped me identify a way to take a person who who has no idea what we're doing and they can clearly kind of finish my sentences for me, which is always a good thing. 
It's a beautiful thing. Well, Thomas says it was, it was a very nice presentation. James Burton wants to know in what way are these Reg D shares and warrants different than the common stock we, shares we already own? First of all, James, if you're accredited, then you can participate. Um, but essentially, the Reg D shares are preferred, meaning that they are off to the side, dividend bearing, and then you convert to common shares when you're ready. Warrants obviously generate common shares. So it's the, in the end, it's all common shares. It's simply a more efficient way to invest. And James, if you do have the ability to, uh, to come in as an accredited investor, then I do invite you to do that. I have also some an update because regulation the regulation offering is closed. It, um, it reached its one year anniversary a few days ago, but we have a follow-up. So stay tuned for that. I think it's gonna be much more exciting and uh, for everyone. So as I said, stay tuned. Can I just make one quick comment to James? Um, what I described many times today, again, about a hundred in my discussions on our, on our offering, being able to convert this all into common stock is great. And if we believe the common stock um, does very well, what we tend to do when we own a position in a company is if it moves dramatically, what do we do? We sell half. Why do you sell half? Well, because you don't want to miss out on any further growth. What, what a warrant would allow you to do essentially is liquidate your entire position at a profit some point in the future and get in your time machine uh, you know, six months later and literally come back in the market at five cents a share or 10 cents a share and buy Origin Clear shares all over again, no matter where the price is, whether it's 50 cents, a dollar, a dollar 50. So it literally, it, it's enabling you to kind of re-enter the market at a fixed discount after you're already right. Amen. Well, uh, James, feel free to connect with Ken by putting oc.go slash Ken in your browser. And uh, he is booking up fast. So I suggest that you jump in. And I wanted to also mention that um, next week, we will be discussing our fulfillment partner. Thomas, speak up. Yeah. Yes. Good day, sir. A wonderful presentation. I'm a Floridian and I've uh, been following what's going on down there and uh, in the Sarasota region. Uh, I was wondering, um, this appears to be an investor call. I was wondering, does any of your processes that you guys use involve massive amounts of energy generation that you either need uh, or you, you purchase through uh, you know, electric utilities? Well, uh, Tom, you can certainly answer that. Um, I, I, I can tell you this, that um, the water on demand model can include energy generation from the waste as a way to generate uh, energy. We have a, um, a sister company in the industry called Cambrian Innovation that does it very well with what's called a water and ener water energy purchase agreement. Yeah, I mean, that gets into energy recovery. So like if you're actually like the Florida situation with the phosphate industry, if you were to recover the materials that when you separate the water from the contaminants, some of those are recoverable that then can go off to be used in the, by the energy industry actually. So that's one thing that they, they look for. It's a byproduct that they make profit on. But when it comes to actually running machines like reverse osmosis, yes, you do use a lot of energy. And so part of that is about where, you know, who's deploying it and how they're set up. But the systems that we run are fairly efficient. They're very modern. You know, the one thing about 2021 technology versus like the stuff from like the 1990s is it really runs well and it's not that intensive. So, you know, that, that's just one of the, the wonders of modern technology now. I'm going to buy a new home thank and you. save money. <laughs> Thomas, thank you very much for uh, piping up. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, with that, we've come to our magical moment. Thank you, Tom, for jumping in. And Ken, it's been a pleasure discussing this new pitch, which I, I like it a lot. It's very straightforward. Very cool. Value Tax Finance says a few questions. I understand the draw to the investor. What is the value proposition of the end user? Well, the end user is stuck treating water. Let's say you're a brewery, you have, uh, you're growing. The, and what people don't realize is the local municipality increasingly won't take your water. They just said, no, send us treated water only. This is a big problem that is really, really kind of like an iceberg. It's way, way underwater. And so the value proposition of the end user is, lower expense because, and actually, as opposed to trucking all that waste into the other county. I mean, that's how bad it gets. Uh, using the $1,500 phone analogy, the carrier is subsidizing the cost of the device. Is there such a format here? Is the cost supported totally by the 
end user, or is there a possible intermediary that supplements the cost? That is a fascinating thought, and uh, we will be um, exploring that for sure. And I think a lot of big players in the water industry have um, the, the efficiency of large numbers that would allow them to do something like that. Apple can do deals with telcos where the telcos, you know, they have this monthly rip and they, and they can make it all work. So it's, it's a question of who sponsors what. Now, final question is what is OCLN's core competency, i.e. what it separates OCLN from the aqua ventures of the world? Well, it is scale. Businesses, and it, again, Tom, uh, I, we had that pre-COVID meeting with uh, our friend in Hollywood um, where you know he gave us a great meal and he said, I want clean water in my hotel. He's, he would have been too small for an AquaVenture deal. That aqua, those AquaVenture deals are like an entire island being desalinated, for example. So we're able to go down in scale and that is a challenge because it's the hardest thing to do is to miniaturize. But we have that capability with the Dan Early product line, the modular systems that we have. So thank you for that. And I appreciate uh, your really interesting questions. Thank you. And Sadiq, our good friend Sadiq says, how much do you see the market size to keep raising funds in the funds by giving 10% returns to investors? Is it like hundred billion or so? Well, that's highly speculative. I don't know that it ultimately is gonna be a 10% proposition for places like Wall Street. If it's a secured position, right now we're being very, very generous because people are entering these funds as pioneers. And if you have a million dollars to invest, this is a very good place to invest it right now. Eventually though, we know what the cost of money is. I'm, I'm busy negotiating a mortgage right now. If it's secured assets, then it's very close to mortgage rates. And so that is where we're gonna get the, the, the cost of money way, way down. And so we can get, you know, I'm looking forward to making Tom do all the, the sausage making and I get to play on the finance side. Hey, hey. <laughs> Run around and shovel money in. <laughs> you know, actually, I, I actually like his question because you know, there's a bunch of interesting things coming up in the finance market where they're talking about doing these carbon uh, taxation mm. uh, tariffs. Have you read about those? So now mm. all these big companies are being forced into an ESG mode where they're going to have to look at their capital, their cost of capital and their growth being hammered if they don't take into account something that's you know ESG sustainable. So actually our water systems become a possible savior for all these corporations out there that need something like what we do. I like that. And Sadiq says, so it's a good opportunity to join early now, then it'll be mortgage rate later. Yes. I would say definitely if you interested in investing in water at a larger scale than I showed in the presentation, do connect with Ken and uh, it's a good time to do that. Well, we've, uh, we've gone way over. It's been very, very uh, fun. I, we've had a huge audience. Thank you all for being here. Remember to join us next week. It's going to be fascinating discussing how we do fulfillment. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll cover it all on the backside. Have a good, Have a good night, guys. Bye-bye.